New Glenn is finally here. It's on the pad, it's tested, and it's ready to launch. We're anticipating its maiden flight just a few days from now, so we want to give you the whole rundown. Where is it launching from? What's the payload? How will the first stage booster be recovered? Let's get started. At NSF, we've been closely following the development of New Glenn right from the start, and in recent years it's become much easier thanks to our regular flyovers of Blue Origin Space Coast facilities as well as our 24-7 live cameras. This past year has been particularly eventful, with significant progress that's truly exciting. With New Glenn only days away from its inaugural flight, we couldn't be more thrilled to witness this historic milestone. We're finally about to see the launch of a reusable orbital rocket that isn't built by SpaceX. In case you've been living under a rock for the last few years, New Glenn is the heavy lift rocket developed by Blue Origin, the company already known for flying the New Shepard suborbital vehicle. It's been a long journey for Blue Origin to get to this point, but with the completion of a static fire test and the granting of a launch license, it seems the final milestones have been checked off. And now, here we are, just days away from witnessing this beast finally take to the skies. So what is this maiden flight all about? What's inside the payload fairing? And Initially, it was planned to carry the escapade mission for NASA. NASA paid $20 million for the launch services of the twin escapade spacecraft to Mars, and this was intended to be the maiden flight of New Glenn in October. However, recently it became evident that New Glenn would not meet the launch window planned for the escapade spacecraft, so this mission was rescheduled for a later flight. Being an interplanetary mission and all, you can't just launch whenever you like. Now, this rocket will carry the Blue Ring payload. Blue Ring, according to Blue Origin, is an all-in-one satellite bus designed for testing and certification on the rocket. It's quite a small payload, as you can see here within the payload fairing. It's almost comically small, because this is an incredibly large fairing. More on that later. Alongside the payload, a key focus on this mission is the maiden flight of the New Glenn rocket itself. This marks only the third flight of the BE-4 engine, which so far has flown on two Vulcan flights, and it's the first time it's being used on the New Glenn rocket. Since New Shepard operates suborbital missions, this launch will also be Blue Origin's first orbital flight as a company since it was founded in 2000. Before delving deeper into the rocket itself, let's take a moment to examine Blue Ring. The truth is, there are still many uncertainties surrounding this payload, and we hope that some of these questions will be answered in the coming days. According to Blue Origin, the Blue Ring spacecraft is designed to support a variety of missions in medium Earth orbit and beyond. To put it simply, it allows researchers to focus less on developing their own propulsion systems for their projects. Instead, they can attach their payloads to a Blue Ring spacecraft, which can then deliver them to their desired orbits. This concept is comparable to other integrated solutions, such as Rocket Lab's Photon, but Blue Origin aims to offer a comprehensive in-house option for these services in the future. While the exact performance specifications of the Blue Ring platform remain undisclosed, Blue Origin describes it on their website as having, quote, unprecedented Delta V capabilities. For those unfamiliar, Delta V refers to the measure of a spacecraft's ability to change its velocity, a critical factor in orbital maneuvers and mission flexibility. While the exact meaning of unprecedented is unclear, such a claim suggests that the platform likely boasts impressive capabilities. It's not something you would highlight if its performance was on the lower end of the spectrum. In addition to its impressive propulsion capabilities, Blue Origin states that the Blue Ring platform also includes refueling capabilities, a data relay, hosting space, and in-space computing power. While the payload might seem small inside the fairing, it's important to remember that this is not a full-scale test. The fairing of New Glenn is an enormous 21.9 meters tall, making it one of the largest fairings in the rocket world today, although it's still dwarfed by the potential payload space of Starship. The best place to start with the vehicle itself is with the general structure of the booster, referred to as GS-1. GS-1 stands for Glenn Stage 1 because, if it wasn't obvious, it's the first stage of New Glenn. In addition, the second stage is called GS-2, or Glenn Stage 2. GS-1 is made up of three main components, the aft module, the mid module, and the forward module. The aft module houses the stage's seven BE-4 engines, along with six landing legs. This is similar to the thrust section of Starship, for example. Additionally, it features a thrust puck and all the necessary plumbing to supply the BE-4s with liquid methane, which Blue are branding as liquid natural gas, and liquid oxygen. 
The aft module also includes the gimbal control for the BE4 engines. Not all seven first stage engines can gimbal, only three arranged in a line, including the center engine. The giant landing legs will deploy using gravity assist, taking around eight seconds to fully extend. The deployment process will begin 14 seconds before landing, with the legs ideally fully deployed six seconds before touchdown. Above that is the mid module, which primarily consists of the tanks holding liquid oxygen and liquid natural gas. It also features two large aerodynamic strakes that provide extra lift during flight. These strakes are static and do not have any moving capabilities. Their purpose is to help increase the lift during re-entry, similar to how Starship's belly flop works. By providing more surface area, they improve the rocket's cross-range capabilities, allowing it to glide further and control its descent rather than just falling straight down. Why is that good? Well, by using aerodynamics to brake and steer, you reduce the need for a longer boost back burn and rely less on propulsion overall to land. This helps to conserve fuel, making the landing process more efficient. Believe it or not, Falcon 9 conducts a similar manoeuvre when it is coming back into land. It might not have the aerodynamic surfaces like New Glenn, but the fuselage of the boost to generates enough lift to drift through the atmosphere. And sitting on top is the forward module, which serves as an interstage and houses the four actuating control fins, as well as the reaction control system or RCS and avionics. This module likely also contains much of the computing and processing power for the first stage, enabling it to steer itself during both ascent and descent, ultimately guiding it back down to the drone ship called Jacqueline. The four actuating control fins are quite similar to the grid fins found on the Falcon 9 first stage. These grid fins provide steering during the faster aerodynamic phase of the flight, and they can be adjusted by the grid fin motors located inside the interstage. With all three of these modules combined, GS-1 measures 57.5 meters in length and has a diameter of 7 meters, although the aft module tapers out to 8.5 meters. This is just shy of the 9 meters in diameter of Starship and significantly larger than the 3.7 meters of Falcon 9. One of the key aspects that drove the design of New Glenn's first stage is, of course, Blue Origin's plan to reuse them right from the first recovery. For instance, several components are protected by a thermal protection system called Comet. Comet was developed in-house by Blue Origin and tested on New Shepard flights to help shield critical components of New Glenn during its re-entry after launch, ensuring that the booster can be turned around quickly. Comet can be seen covering the aft module of the stage, the strakes, raceway and the forward module including the four fins. According to Jeff Bezos, this thermal protection system will allow GS-1 to be reused at least 25 times, although Blue Origin's goal is to eventually reach 100 flights per booster. This thermal protection is extremely important as Blue Origin will only be performing downrange landings for New Glenn's boosters, at least for now. As we've learned from SpaceX's Falcon 9 landings, when the booster lands downrange from the launch pad, there is more energy involved, which leads to higher temperatures during re-entry. With GS-1 planned to land as far as 1,000 kilometers downrange, it's fair to say that re-entry will be quite intense. Now, apart from the booster itself, another key component of Blue's reuse plans for New Glenn is, of course, the company's ocean fleet. The main star of the show is Jacqueline, the company's sea-based landing platform. Originally constructed in Romania, Jacqueline arrived at Port Canaveral in early September 2024. However, the Jacqueline we see today wasn't the initial plan. In 2018, Blue Origin purchased a large ship named Stena Freighter, which they planned to convert into a sea-based landing platform for New Glenn's first stage. However, the ship was scrapped in late 2022 after Blue decided a more simple barge-style platform was best. As cool as it would have been to see a booster come into Port Canaveral on such a large ship, it's understandable that it was likely overkill and a landing platform like the current version of Jacqueline makes much more sense. So how big is Jacqueline and how does she compare to SpaceX's drone ships? SpaceX's drone ship, just read the instructions, measures around 90 meters long and 46 meters wide. Jacqueline, on the other hand, is about 116 meters long and 46 meters wide. Here they are sitting side by side it turns out that they have a very similar area for the rocket to land on. This may seem odd due to New Glenn being a much larger rocket than Falcon 9, right? But really, it's not that simple. When deployed, the span of Falcon 9's four landing legs is about 20 meters. New Glenn's leg span is only about 17 meters, based on the aft section simulator we've spotted at Port Canaveral. This is because when a vehicle has more landing legs, the center of gravity and weight can be distributed more evenly. 
This leads to the rocket being more stable and having a relatively smaller leg span than it would need with four legs. How about fairing recovery? We've seen SpaceX turn fairing recovery from an experimental portion of their missions to just another standard operation. And with New Glenn having such massive fairings, it would make sense for Blue to pursue this as well. As it turns out, we know Blue has looked into fairing recovery because in late 2022, our Space Coast Live cameras captured a single New Glenn fairing half being floated around in the turning basin at the Kennedy Space Center. Not only this, but we know that on at least two separate occasions, Blue used a helicopter to fly a fairing half offshore from the Space Coast to conduct drop tests in the ocean. Let's talk about BE-4, the powerhouse of New Glenn. The reality is that we still lack a lot of information about this engine, as Blue Origin has not been particularly transparent about its performance data. However, we hope to receive an update during the launch webcast. Overall, it is an oxygen-rich staged combustion engine that uses, as you might have gathered, LNG and LOX. From what we know, Blue Origin is not using super-chilled propellants like Falcon 9, but instead employs relatively hotter propellants. However, they are still very cold, as both propellants remain in their liquid state. The engine produces 2,400 kilonewtons of thrust, which is about the same as three Merlin engines, or roughly equivalent to one Raptor engine. The engine is designed to be reliable, prioritizing dependability over extreme performance. As Blue Origin states, it is, quote, designed to be a medium-performing version of a high-performance architecture. For landing, throttle control is crucial, as it provides the necessary control and maneuverability during this delicate phase of flight. The engine is capable of throttling down to as low as 40% of its maximum thrust. Now that we've covered New Glenn's first stage, let's take a look at the second stage, GS2. As mentioned earlier, GS2 stands for Glenn Stage 2. The structure of the tank measures 16 meters in length and 7 meters in width. After the integration of the twin BE3U engines, the total length of the stage increases to around 23 meters. You might be wondering, why use a hydrogen upper stage when the first stage runs on LNG? Well, the original plan was to use LNG for the upper stage and develop a vacuum version of the BE-4 called BE-4U. However, plans changed. In contrast to the tank structure of the first stage, you can see how much larger the hydrogen tank is compared to the oxygen tank on the second stage. Hydrogen's density is significantly less than oxygen or methane, hence this huge tank size difference. Hydrogen, of course, offers high efficiency as a second stage fuel, so it's not a bad decision. However, it does come with its challenges, as hydrogen is notoriously difficult to handle. Fortunately, Blue Origin has experience with hydrogen from its new Shepard rocket, so they are well aware of both the advantages and challenges of working with this fuel. Looking to the future, Blue Origin intends to develop a reusable second stage. We've seen tests of the Project Jarvis hardware, which appears to be a test program for reusable second stage technology. However, this program hasn't been implemented yet and doesn't seem to be a primary focus for Blue Origin at the moment, as testing for Jarvis has been on hold for a significant period of time. The BE-3U is even less well known than the BE-4. Unlike the first stage, the second stage actually uses two of these BE-3U engines. The BE in the name stands for Blue Engine, while the U is assumed to indicate Upper for the Upper Stage variant. Each BE-3U engine produces 770 kilonewtons of thrust, which is quite powerful, though certainly not the most powerful second stage engines out there. The nozzles of the BE-3U are notably large, measuring 2.9 meters long. This design is intended to optimize the performance of the stage in the vacuum of space, giving it the necessary thrust to perform the mission's required maneuvers. Of course, there's one more piece of crucial infrastructure to cover. That's the rocket's launch pad, Launch Complex 36, or LC-36. Now, some people might still call it Slick 36, and if you ask me, that's what this complex should be called, but Blue Origin refers to it simply as LC-36. Back in September of 2015, Jeff Bezos announced that Blue Origin would take over Complex 36, which includes both Launch Complex 36A and 36B, as well as Launch Complex 11. These were all combined to form the current Launch Complex 36. Historically, Launch Complex 36A and 36B supported 145 launches of the Atlas family of rockets between 1962 and 2005, including missions such as the Pioneer, Surveyor, and Mariner probes. Launch Complex 11 supported 33 Atlas rocket launches between 1958 and 1964, with one of the launches carrying the world's first communications satellite, SCORE, into low Earth orbit. Blue Origin broke ground on the site in 
and June 2016, with land clearing work taking place throughout 2017, including the delivery of several very large propellant tanks for the LNG and LOX farms. In 2018, the tanks were installed on their pedestals and major foundation work began on the launch pad, hangar and towers. By 2020, the large 13,000 square meter integration facility, the 106 meter tall water tower and two massive 175 meter tall towers drastically changed the skyline of the Space Coast. The large liquid hydrogen tank farm was also installed by this time. Since then, Blue has installed the launch table, which measures around 16 by 16 meters and weighs 726 metric tons, and constructed the massive transporter Erector, which is almost the same size as the rocket itself at 90 meters long and weighing around 1800 metric tons. This pad might even be a bit overdesigned, as Jeff Bezos has hinted at in the past that this pad would even be suited for their next rocket after New Glenn, which is supposedly going to be New Armstrong. And before you ask, we, we don't know anything about this rocket. There are a few things to keep in mind during the main launch event. Blue Origin has two sets of flare stacks. One set is active during tank farm activity and the other is for direct pad flow, which will only be active during pad flow operations. We've seen this system active in the past few days during intensive second stage testing and several static fire attempts. So don't be surprised if the launch involves similar checks and attempts before flight and possibly some scrubs. After all, it's a giant and new rocket. Things can happen and it's not a bad thing to hold off until everything is ready to go. So what's next? As of the recording of this video, Blue Origin still needs to lower and roll back New Glenn, remove the test fairing, replace it with the actual fairing that contains the blue ring payload and then roll the rocket back out for launch. Other than that, everything seems to be in place. Even the FAA recently announced that the rocket is cleared for launch by issuing a launch license. They've also approved the recovery profile and granted an orbital launch license for up to five years. Blue Origin currently has the flight scheduled for as early as January 4th. There are some pushes to conduct the launch in 2024, but given they need to roll back, integrate the fairing, roll out again, you can see where some delays might appear. Knowing our luck, it'll launch within a few hours of Starship's seventh flight. After that, it largely depends on whether Blue Origin will be able to land the booster on the first try. However, even if they don't, they already have a lot of hardware in development and will return to flight in 2025 regardless of the outcome of Flight 1. Blue is aiming for the next mission to carry the company's Blue Moon Mark 1 Pathfinder mission to the moon, assuming the lander is ready in time. Shortly after that, the Escapade mission, as things currently stand. Also, as we mentioned earlier, the first two launches of New Glenn will serve as demonstration flights for the National Security Space Launch Program, which will allow Blue to fly classified national security payloads in the future. I'm sure the Space Force is going to love that massive payload fairing space. Following that, attention will quickly shift to Kuiper, Amazon's internet satellite constellation. While Blue Origin and Amazon are technically two separate companies, they share a close relationship, you know, both being founded by Jeff Bezos and all. Getting the Kuiper Constellation operational will be one of the main objectives for the early flights of New Glenn. In 2025, we'll likely see multiple, not just one, multiple New Glenn flights. Let us know in the comments how many flights do you think are realistically going to happen in 2025. Of course, NSF will be covering live the maiden flight of New Glenn. We'll be on air hours before the flight and we hope you'll join us to watch this massive rocket launch for the first time and hopefully land. I've been Ryan Caton for NSF, thanks for watching and goodbye.